This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Breaking news. I'll bring in my uh, f- frequent co-host, and that's Wayne Viner. Wayne, I'm, I know you just heard it when I heard it. We all know that Buck was fired early in the afternoon, and Ken Rosenthal, pretty good source, just reported Dan Duquette, is hitting the curb. He's going to get let go, and that's a surprise to many people. Uh, is it a, so Bruce, you on season tickets out there for forever. You actually still go to the games. Is this a surprise to you? It's a surprise about Duquette. It really is, because Duquette made all these deals, and it was kind of like in his hands. But uh, maybe this signals the beginning of the Brady Anderson era. And uh, some of the rumors on the replacement for Buck, of course, are Mike Bordick or uh, Billy Ripken, or they could go out of the box with someone else. But we're going to see a whole new Oriole organization next year. And uh, I don't think many people can fight that. But I was surprised about Duquette because Duquette made all the deals. Or maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he made them in conjunction with Brady or whatever. But... uh, you know, it's according to Ken Rosenthal, you know, that Duquette is going as well. That's not official. Buck is official. Buck uh, Showwater was let go today at 1 o'clock. And uh, we got to pay tribute to him, uh, Wayne, because he really changed things with the Orioles. He had a great run until this year. Well, nine years of being a major league manager here in Baltimore uh, comes to an end. I guess in some ways he didn't want to be the manager of what looks to be a sort of a triple-A type collection of talent next year. Are you going to miss him, or do you think it's time for him to move on? Nah, I might have kept him, but you know what? I wanted to keep Davis, too, so my my input's not worth anything, all right? Because, uh, you know, it's just I don't think he's the guy to rebuild this team. I really don't. And... Uh, I just think it was just time, and he's had a great run. But 10 years in this day and age is a long time to be manager of a team. And maybe the uh, message just got clouded. And to me, when he didn't bench Machado after Manny did not run out a double play ball that cost us a game, to me, that might have signaled his end to me. That's just my opinion. Because I was I was upset that night, but no, I I, I don't know who you're going to get. That's the key thing. I mean, is Mike Bordick the answer? Is 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 uh, Billy Ripken the answer? I don't know. But uh, I, I'm just as concerned as who's actually going to be on the field. Never mind who's managing the group. What's your take on the fact that the whole group of players that were traded away all are in the postseason in some form or another? Well, it doesn't surprise me. They were all traded away to contenders. And certainly you look at Kevin Gaussman and look how well he's done. And Josh Hader up in Milwaukee and, uh, you know, Manny starring for the Dodgers. Scope's been a major disappointment for Milwaukee. But Milwaukee's got uh, a guy by the name of Lorenzo Cain. And wherever Cain goes, it seems like a winner's born. This guy's an outright winner. They got the hottest hitter in baseball. And... Uh, it doesn't surprise me. Disappointed in Scope's performance. I'm rooting for them all. You know, they served the Orioles well. Just it was time to move on. Orioles were losers. It's that simple. 115 losses in one year is a lot. A lot. It's, it's well, kind of... That's our, I guess that's our Orioles wrap-up for today <laughs> and for the season. Um, well, well, while I got you on the phone, I'm going to spend one minute before we get into Maryland, Michigan, which is certainly the reason people are tuning in. Uh, Ryder Cup, I don't know if you heard it. I know you heard about the quarrel between Patrick Reed and Jordan Spieth, where Patrick Reed said Spieth just didn't want to play with him. And, uh, you know, he wanted to open up at the postgame uh, press conference, but he didn't. But today it came out. That the two best friends on the team, probably Brooks Kepka and DJ uh, Johnson, almost came to blows. I mean, that's these- what I was reading on on social media. I guess it was much later last night. What happened? I don't know. They went. They you know it's 
It's a tradition that the losers go to the winner's party and they all have fun together and get drunk and eat. And they just realize that, you know, the Ryder Cup's over for two years. And uh, sure enough, supposedly they were there, got into a, a shouting argument. And I believe it because Tim Rosefort tweeted it. He's a big guy on the Golf Channel. And uh, apparently the Euros had to separate them. This is unbelievable. This is like me and you getting into a fist fight, you know? Yeah. That's, no, really. That I mean, hasn't happened. No, it, yeah. we're, we're close enough where that's not going to But sure. imagine if that happened. These guys train together. They talk every day. They live. I don't know what happened, but something happened. I don't know. You know, don't know. I, and Patrick, uh, not Patrick Reed, uh, uh, Brooks Kepta denied it. And uh, he was sick about that. Whatever happened came out. And he said, we're still best friends. And, you know, maybe they were drunk. I mean, I don't know. But Who knows? It's, it's been some strange stuff going around in sports. Uh, we, I guess the last time I saw the Ryder Cup, because I was elsewhere on Sunday, it was ten and a half to nine and a half. But you said at that point it was over, and boy, you were right. Yeah, well, when, when it was ten and a half to nine and a half, that's uh, twenty matches, twenty points, and there were eight points left. And Europe was ahead, I think, in six of them. And all they needed was four and a half. And they were ahead substantially in three of them. So it wasn't like it was almost, it was, it was no drama. It was just a matter of when and where. I mean, Mickelson was five down and DJ was five, four down. It was like no hope. So uh, even though it was ten and a half to nine and a half, the twain was not close, but that's another story for another day. But USA Ryder Cup's got some serious problems, serious problems, and they got a lot. To well, the Ryder Cup, the World Cup, I haven't heard the U.S. name, and the Davis Cup, these things aren't going well lately. No, it really isn't. But uh, you know what? That's what happens when these guys make $10 million a year. And I wonder, you know, what member of the USA team would rather win the Ryder Cup than the Masters? You know, I, I don't know if there's any. And on the European team, I think almost to a man, they'd rather win that Ryder Cup and beat the USA. And uh, whatever. But speaking of champions, we'll get to Maryland yet. But speaking of champions, your Stanley Cup champions, the My Washington Stanley Capitals. Cup. I'll say you're. They're partially mine, but not like you. But uh, your Stanley Cup champions hit the ice tonight against the Bruins. Uh, that, that's my big entertainment for tonight. Yes, a championship banner is going to be unveiled. No, I didn't go downtown for this one, although I, I wanted to, downtown D.C. As you say, it, it's, it's a new year. It's a new season. And I'm, I and uh, many other Cats fans still stuck in the moment. It seems like we, the Cup ended just weeks ago. I know it was June. Does it's still warm out? It just doesn't seem like the whole season's gone by. It's such a short off season for hockey, but the Caps started up again. And I guess you take one more run at winning something and keeping the team together. They did a great job of keeping all the guys. And uh, the Caps news, relevant news of the day is Tom Wilson, known for his big hitting, suspended for 20 games for a hit in the last preseason game. You want another reason why the preseason for any sport isn't any good? We lost our number one tough guy forward for 20 games. Was that because of that side elbow he threw at somebody? Yep. It didn't look, you know, I, I'm for the rough and tumble of hockey and football, et cetera. But those days, the, the games that we used to watch growing up, they're gone. Wait, let me ask you a question. Why would you make a cheap hit in an exhibition game? Because he plays one way. That's just him. Well, that's the coach's it's, fault for playing him. So the well, coach is off to a great start. He lost his best defenseman and an integral part of the team for one quarter of the season. That's not good. Well, a big hitting forward. Look, they picked up. Well, we can have more Caps talk once the season starts. But my relevant game, other than the Caps tonight, is you got Maryland and Michigan. And I'm not saying the Terps are going to win. I'm just saying I expect the Maryland team to be in the game this time. 17 and, and a half point underdogs. 
Uh, you know, when you look, I was taking a look at the Michigan stats today, and nothing comes out and hits you in the eye, which tells me a lot of their TDs must have been on, like, turnovers deep in the territory because their defense is, is excellent. You can't deny that. Their defense is great, but like Patterson, their quarterback is 76 for 111. That's not earth shattering. You know what I mean? No, the, the knock on this team and sort of a Harbaugh style knock is the defense is good. The offense has not been good, consistently not been good. If they really want to win something, they got to get a better offense, and they keep blaming it's the quarterback, it's this, it's that. They, this is the third quarterback, third legit starting quarterback he's had. Same problems. Yeah, they run the ball pretty well. Uh, they have a standout fifth-year defensive end, which is uh, Vinovich. He's been the player of the week, several defensive player of the week. Shea Patterson hasn't set the world on fire as the quarterback. They have the one loss early in the year. Uh, to Notre Dame. No disgrace. No disgrace, yeah. yeah. But, uh... They, they barely squeaked by Northwestern last weekend. I watched most of that game as a scouting. They were trailing Northwestern 17 to nothing and won the game. Well, they're not Ohio State. They really aren't, and they're probably not Penn State. Which, by the way, James Franklin did it again. He did it again. That fourth down call is one of the worst calls I've ever seen. It was almost unbelievable. For those of you who didn't watch, fourth and five, and and the quarterback, Trace McSorley, who is fantastic, every time he has the ball in his hands, he's able to run for five or six yards. I think he ran for 170. What does he do? He does a hey-diddle-diddle up the middle play. Got stopped, game's over. I still don't believe it, Wayne. Well, you're jumping in on the end. This is another case why I was – texting you about big game James, the biggest games that they've had. Uh, they had a, a big lead over USC in the Rose Bowl two years ago by two touchdowns. They lost the game. They had an unbelievable lead at Ohio State last year up by 13 points. They lost the game again in a whiteout, the largest crowd they've ever had. And whether I like them or not, I'm impressed by their whiteout. You had to be impressed. You had to. They, they blow another 13-point lead. And if, the, if this doesn't work for him, it's, he certainly recruit. They're in these games against the top teams in the country. They don't finish them well. They're going to have to. And that's sort of the Harbaugh story. Yeah, they're pretty good. But over the past couple of years... Harbaugh doesn't win the big games either. And the big money alumni, they're not so happy. They're not, neither Penn State nor Michigan want to go into these games and lose. But that's what's been happening. Yeah, for sure. And old Scott Frost, Frost is having a little problem at Nebraska, isn't he? Oh, my goodness. They're going to be, they played Bethune Cookman as a makeup game. The second game of the season they had against, I believe it was Tulsa, was rained out. Akron. I'm sorry, it was Akron that was raining. So Bethune Cookman's a makeup game in about three weeks. That appears to be the only game they might be favored in. And this is Nebraska. They have 370 sellouts in a row. They were sky high for this, and they're horrible. That four Michigan beat Nebraska 56 to 10. They beat Northwestern 20 to 17. They got Maryland at 12 o'clock. And yes, Maryland now can be called the uh, the king of 12 o'clock. we got more 12 o'clock games than anybody. Is the next one at 12 o'clock? Uh, homecoming, I believe, is at 12 o'clock. We might get, as you've been saying, we might November 3rd as a night game. Um, who knows? Maybe, maybe every game we have will be at 12 o'clock. We're the high noon team. So anyway, look at it. Look at it. Uh, Michigan, 411 yards of offense. That's certainly not bad. Defense are only allowing 232. That, that's, is that leading the Big Ten? I would assume that it is. That is. Uh, Maryland, the, I think they're one. Maryland's three still, I believe. Huh. That's impressive. 37 to 14 is their average point differential. And uh, you, think there's, you think Maryland will keep it under that 17.5 point spread? 
I, I think this time Maryland does keep it under the spread. I really think the talent level is coming up uh, with D.J. Durkin or with Matt Canada. Whoever. This team actually has some talent. Uh, goes up with that one stinker game against Temple, uh, which is the first home game that was actually at Maryland Stadium. But I think they redeemed themselves pretty well against Minnesota two weeks ago. Um, hopefully a uh, week off isn't going to hurt Maryland that much. I think they actually were going in the right direction. All right, elsewhere you, elsewhere around college football, you have Texas, who had that one stinker game against Maryland. All right, an eight-point underdog in the Red River shootout at the Cotton Bowl against Oklahoma. is Texas is becoming for real, Wayne. I really believe that. I've argued with Mason about that a couple times. But uh, you can't fight their record, and if they pulled off this one, they're going to climb in that in that top twenty, and boy, would that be great for Maryland. Look, you got to root for everybody Maryland plays against to be highly ranked because it's really our only shot to jump up. Maryland ranked thirty first this week. Interesting thing about Oklahoma is their quarterback, who's actually a baseball player, is now ranked third in the Heisman early season Heisman voting behind the Alabama quarterback. And now I can't remember who number two is. And then Will Greer from uh, West Virginia is very highly ranked. And then Murray from Oklahoma. Wow. Back-to-back Heismans, that would be unbelievable. Northwestern that's playing Michigan State. They're getting 11 at Michigan State. You, and, and that game is, I think that game is a, a bit of a quandary. I really do. I thought Northwestern looked great against Michigan early. And uh, if they can put in the same kind of effort, that one has the potential of being an upset. Uh, well, I, jury's out. I'm still on Michigan State. I don't know whether they're really any good, but but they're thought of highly, so that's a start for them. Uh, you have LSU uh, laying two points at Florida. LSU's been a surprise with that quarterback. He's done fantastic. A transfer who lo- he's the guy who lost out to uh, Haskins at Ohio State, and right. rather than stick around, he said goodbye to Urban Meyer. And uh, he's now doing a – is it Bowman? Is that his name? Uh, for some reason, it doesn't come to me. I know exactly who you're talking about. Right. But, but the name isn't registering. Right. So if you're going to talk about quarterbacks that are making a difference, I know you have Dennis on next. But – and it, even though it's the college football segment, Patrick Mahomes for the Kansas City Chiefs has just been lights out amazing. I yeah, the way he played the other night. Mayfield. To, c- to come from behind. And, of course, the Ravens get make Baker Mayfield this week. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the Ravens with Dennis coming up. Uh, Notre Dame at Virginia Tech. Notre Dame just keeps winning. Uh, I mean, at Virginia Tech's never easy except the uh, – who just beat them there? Was it Akron? Well, they lost at Old Dominion. At Old Dominion, excuse me. Right. Uh, that was one of the biggest upsets and happiest moments I've seen a football team have was ODU beating Virginia Tech. Yeah. But I, I expect Notre Dame to, to come through on this when they have a new quarterback and they take out a guy who is actually winning, which seems to be a trend. Clemson did it, almost cost them a game. But, hey, Wimbush beats Michigan. Looks to be doing fairly well, but this kid, Book, really can throw the football. And uh, the resurgence of passing offense there at Notre Dame, he looked good on Saturday. Uh, for sure. And look, Notre Dame also is undefeated. Wayne, that's it. We'll talk a lot more about the Maryland game on Saturday. Great opportunity for Maryland. Look, they get four shots a year to pull off a major upset. And this is number one. And this is probably their, I would say, their second best chance of pulling off the upset in their five tough games. Uh, we'll see what happens. Thanks a lot for coming on. And we will talk to you Saturday morning. You guys, thanks for having me, and go Turks. All right, back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300, uh, heading for our first break. Welcome back to Coons Ford Turp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment two. Got my good buddy from Coons Ford, uh, the number one, Coons Ford is security, number one Ford dealer in the area. And that, of course, is Dennis Kolossitz. Big guy, welcome in. Hey, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure, Dennis. And I know it's a happy Dennis Kolossitz. 
Because you were right last week, and the Ravens out physical, outplayed the Steelers. It wasn't even close, was it? No, they just played a perfect uh, game on uh, both sides of the ball. Special teams with Justin Tucker is always big. Four second half, half field goals. And we're still waiting for an NFL team, Bruce, to score on the Baltimore Ravens defense in the second half this year. No touchdowns allowed. I think that says a lot uh, about uh, Wink Martindale and the halftime adjustments he's made. So the, the key thing I, I wanted to bring up, number one, uh, Buck Allen I thought was fantastic. I really did. And, and he's going to see more time. And Collins has to cut out the fumbling. Because if he doesn't fumble that game, don't you feel that game would have been a blowout? Oh, absolutely. There's no no question about it. It would have been twenty one nothing at you know at that point, and the Ravens had all kind of momentum going in their favor. And Collins, it was just a matter of technique. He's a right hand dominant runner, Bruce. He he doesn't switch hands when he's running to the left side, and so when he cut back, he exposed the ball to the defenders. He didn't have his body between the ball and the football. It's a matter of technique. He knows it. The coaches know know it, and. Um, you know, he just had some bad habits. I don't know if they can be corrected at this stage of his career. Well, you know, when you do that to a guy like Sean Davis from Maryland, Sean Davis is going to strip the ball, and that's exactly what he did. Dennis, got to talk about James Hurst a little bit, because it seems to me that with the return of Marshall Yonda, James Hurst is probably a 25% better player having Yonda right on his side. Yeah, that couple with Bruce, you saw, you saw James Hurst at North Carolina for four years when he was in the ACC in college. He was a, a very solid right tackle. That's his best position, and he's played well enough to hold off Orlando Brown Jr. But any time you have a future Hall of Famer like Marshall Yana next to you, it certainly doesn't make you a better player. Some of the holes that they created for uh, that one hole that was called back for some kind of procedure or something uh, – I think, I honestly believe Lamar Jackson would still be running untouched. Right, yeah, because Lamar, yeah, go ahead. That hole, you or me could have fit through. Yeah, that was a great call. and Unfortunately, they had a procedure call. And for all the people who say, why is Lamar Jackson out there? They, they just don't know football. Well, when Lamar Jackson's out there, he gets the attention of the safeties and the linebackers. So they're able to do many great things. And it's just a matter of time before they, they throw the ball to Lamar Jackson. And he pulls up and throws it downfield. That's coming. Uh, and the game near you, and probably in a, at a critical point. And you had to love some of the calls, uh, the tight end lining up next to the center, going out for a pass. That was a big, big play. That was a Belichick call. Yeah, very creative. Yeah. Very creative. I thought the fourth and one call to Chris Moore, what was it, like a jet inside jet sweep, you know, that yeah. easily got the first down. I thought that, uh, you know, we have to all say that we might have been wrong with Marty Morningway because he's proven when the talent's there, he can make it happen. Are you concerned about the drops from Crabtree? Uh, of course, but that's that's been, you know, those of us who have followed Crabtree throughout his, his career, he's always he's going to drop the ball every now and then, but he's a very good football player, and uh, but he doesn't have the best hands. Comparing, comparing him to Willie Sneed, what about Willie Sneed? To me, that's been the guy, right, in the slot. He's been That's great. A chain mover. He's been phenomenal. And yeah. you know what? You got to give credit where credit is due. Max Williams has been great. He really has been. I mean, he's possession receiver, had a great game last week. And uh, do we get Hayden Hurst back this week? Looks like we get Hayden Hurst back this week. Bruce, we're going to have four real good tight ends on his roster. And I don't know who they sit for game day, if they, if they put all four in the game, uh, active anyway. But uh, Joe Flack, was, he's, you know, he's gone from uh, feast to fat, from. Uh, Famine to feast, right? No more for Sharp Perryman. He's got all these guys that can get downfield and actually catch the ball. Has Perryman landed anywhere yet? No, he was caught after three days with the, with the Redskins, you know, that uh, and talked about in your show before, and he, nobody's picked him up. I mean, again, you can't fix some of the things that are wrong with him. You know, he might have a career in the CFL maybe because he's so fast the feels wider, but... Uh, nobody's picked them up. Well, the, the Ravens have one dilemma this week because Jimmy Smith is coming back. What do you do with Brandon Carr? That's a great dilemma, dilemma Bruce. Uh, you can study matchups. You can uh, you can keep the guys fresh. Uh, Brandon Carr is also better. He was, he's been around for a minute, right? So you can mix and match these guys, too. They play a lot of dime. Um, they play some quarter defense. So, look, he'll, he'll get some snaps, too. Uh, and Jimmy Smith... Is he back all the way? I don't know. They're going to try to ease him in, or they're going to throw him to the fire. They have good problems at cornerback. 
No, it's a great problem. When you have Marlon Humphrey and Jimmy Smith on either side, you're in real good shape. But I got to tell you, Brandon Carr was great last week. He broke up a pass to Juju, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, and uh, that was a definite touchdown if he didn't knock it out. And he was definitely impressive. He was impressive, as was uh, Marlon uh, Humphrey. He was uh, extremely impressive. He allowed the one touchdown pass to Antonio Brown, but he had them the, the 62 yards, I believe, total. I mean, that's just, they crushed the Steelers. 50 total yards in the second half, Bruce. Uh, two out of 12 first, uh, first, I'm sorry, two out of 12 third down. They got him off the field. Um, I mean, it's crazy. And you look at the new, the, to me, the new heart and soul of the team is Eric Weddle. His dance up top, you know, and then talking about, I told you these weren't the old Ravens. That was epic. And Tony Jefferson's playing great. Right now, you got to love this defense. You know, you but, do it. And, and C.J. Mosley coming back was huge, Bruce. He played a big, big part in stopping the, the run for the Steelers. Yeah, what's uh, Deion Sanders was just going nuts over the Ravens, you know, and uh, got to take it one week at a time. It's no cakewalk this week. They're three point favorites in Cleveland, but Baker Mayfield put up forty two last week. That's a lot of points, Dennis. It is. I think clearly right now, at four games in, the two best teams in the AFC are the Baltimore Ravens and the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, that's uh, mm-hmm. we'll see if they hold true and stay the course for the rest of the season. But that may be your AFC championship. Uh, game for the right to go to the Super Bowl. Rookies never do that great against the Ravens. What kind, What will they present Baker Mayfield with? How will uh, How will Wink attack him? Well, he's going to have his hands full. Uh, if he thought playing against the Raiders defense in Oakland was tough, this, this Ravens defense is at a whole different level, um, especially when your receivers can't get separation. They'll confuse him. They'll, they'll throw some things at him. And, uh, but you know, the odd maker say it's a three-point game, so they're giving Cleveland a shot to beat us for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And certainly the way Cleveland's been playing, you know, a couple breaks, they could be 3-1. Yeah. Uh, very capable. Yeah, ex- very capable. Yeah, it, it, you know, I'm happy for Cleveland. You know, it's been too long that they've been, you know, so down. But uh, let's let them come back the week after this, all right? <laughs> I with you. They can start winning, just not right now. Yeah, well, the, the team I'm waiting for is uh, Cincinnati coming to Baltimore. Licking their chops and that, you know, they lost Tyler Eifert for the year. Big, big loss for them. That big tight end really makes their offense go. And you think Le'Veon Bell watched that game and says, wait a minute, my guys are getting creamed by the Ravens. i got to get back. Well, I don't know why he would do that, Bruce. I mean, right now, I mean, they have a great chance of missing the playoffs. So why come back and play for a team that's going to miss the playoffs? Why get beat up and, and, and put more wear and tear in your body? There's a report out. He'll come back after week seven, after the bye week. He'll get paid for the bye week, and then he'll play the next week. But... I, that doesn't make any sense to me. He might as well just sit out the rest of the season. Well, look at Thomas from Seattle. You know, he might have. Right. I mean, when you're a free agent, you know, and your team's not going anywhere, what in the world are you doing? But why are you That's playing? Fair. If you He will get the money from somebody. You know that. Somebody well, will. Ad, yeah. If I'm advising Bruce, I'm telling him, you know, stay out the rest of the season. Don't play at all. There's no upside to There is no upside to Le'Veon Bell playing right now and if, if you really care about his teammates he should have been there for game one and I don't want to hear that you know it, it, it's a business so the business decision for him is to stay out Dennis tell us what's going on at Coons Ford uh, the 18s are rolling out 19s are coming in still have all the great deals uh, I, I notice interest rates have gone up are you still holding zero we're still holding zero but it's, it's starting to go away Bruce and uh, as inventory are dwindling as you mentioned the 18s are running out of those and 19s are coming in and we just ordered some Ford Rangers today, Bruce. We'll have the new Ford Ranger hitting our showrooms in uh, February of 2019. Wow. Now I heard the Edge came out with a, is it an ST, a Highline uh, Edge? It's a 300-plus uh, horsepower Edge. It's a, it's a rocket ship, and it's a wonderful, wonderful vehicle. We have the new Bronco coming out in 2020, so Ford does have some great product in the pipeline. They always do, and uh, they certainly have a lot of them at uh, Coons Ford. I'll tell you one thing, if you want a truck, they have every truck and manageable, and uh, the inventory is off the charts. The people were off the charts, and uh, it's Coons Ford. Dennis, you run a great dealership, and uh, the President's Award again, did you get it this year? Uh, we're on track for the Triple Crown and the President's Award, Bruce, so that we may get another GT, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that happens. Yeah, I love the follow-up your people do when uh, you buy a car there or you come in for service. They want to know how you were treated from the second you walked in, all right? And there's no, oh, we're going to give you this for the right report. There's none of that. It's all the honest answers, and, uh, of course, it's always top-notch for me. 
Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate it. Dennis, you'll be on tomorrow on the Sunday Sports Voice down the dial. I'll be on as usual at 4.30, and uh, we'll talk to you then. Looking forward to my friend. Go Ravens and go Terps. All right. This is Bruce Posner. You've been listening to Dennis Galatis from Coons Ford. We'll be back in a few minutes. Special guest, Nico Amato. All right, former goalie for the University of Maryland, goalie of the year of the MLL this year. I'm going to talk about what's going on in lacrosse with the possible uh, coming on of a new league. And Nico was uh, garnered into a three-year contract. And it's always great talking to my good friend, Nico Amato. Back in a few minutes. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment three, and it's been a little while since I had him on the show, but he's always my friend, always a great goalie for the University of Maryland. And last year, the MLL Co-Goalie of the Year, quite an honor, and that's also the coach of Immaculata College, and that's my good buddy, Nico Amato. Nico, welcome in, my friend. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Always, always a pleasure. So, uh... Before we talk about your contract and all all that stuff, how have you transitioned into being a head coach? I know you had some experience beforehand, but how much how much do you love it? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot more responsibility, probably a little bit more than I uh, realized going into it. But it's it's pretty cool to be kind of the top of the uh, program and kind of have the final say on some decisions. And it's been challenging in new ways now, kind of grooming other coaches to take some responsibilities off my plate and having the trust for them to do that. And then shifting gears, this is really my first chance I ever had to like really coach an offense. So <clears throat> as a goalie, you know, you, you're really a defensive minded player, but you have to kind of know what works and what doesn't coming at you. So it's been pretty cool to broaden my horizons as a coach and kind of try out some new things. And uh, I think this year we're starting to make some strides collectively as a team. And I think we'll, have a more successful campaign this year than last. Nico, how proud are you that you continued the goalie tradition when you took over from Phipps and then you had your term and you led to Burn Lore, who was All-American, and then to Danny Mars, who was All-American. Well, tell me about that, because you, for three years, you were the guy. There's no doubt. Your accolades were unbelievable. But how proud are you were the guys who followed? Yeah, it's been pretty cool. Uh, I mean, Maryland's always had a strong history of uh, goalies, so you can really go back to the record books and, you know, look at, you know, 10 to 20 that were phenomenal and it starts with guys um, throughout the 70s, probably even earlier than that. But um, just recently from Phipps onward, it's been pretty strong. And I think, you know, all of us have a good relationship and it's pretty cool now that we all get the chance to play against one another and, uh, I'm sure Danny Morris is now going to jump into the league and be, do well. And I think this year will be the first year um, in a little bit that the goalie position has been up for grabs again at Maryland. So it should be interesting to see who kind of takes that spot. Nico, before we get into talk about your new contract and everything in the MLL, uh, tell everybody, did, did the does the shot clock come down to D3 as well as to D1? Yes, it does. Um that's a good question. I had to look it up myself. But, uh, yeah, there's going to be an 80-second shot clock, so you figure you got 20 seconds to clear, and then you're looking to play offense, you know, for 60 seconds, which is pretty similar to the MLL structure right now. Um, you know, the athletes in the MLL get 60 seconds from the time you possess it, so you have 20 seconds to clear. But I think the, the additional 20 is definitely needed for um, college. Uh, I'm not one – that really was a big proponent of the shot clock. Now that it's here, I'm not going to complain about it or, you know, I don't think it's going to hurt the game that much, but I do think, you know, college lacrosse needs to relax with being tampered with all that much and just let the players play. Yeah, it's a great game without it. I had my doubts too, but I know one thing where you got the advantage and that is being a goalie, you understand even now how more important the clear is with the shot clock. Because you really need that shot. You know, you're going to do the best in the early part of the shot clock, I would think. Yeah, I mean, anytime you have more time to attack, you're going to be able to cycle the ball more and you're going to have more chances to uh, catch someone napping on defense. I think that was one of the things that I adjusted with uh, my first few years in the MOL. I didn't really have a lot of game experience. 
<clears throat> but in practice, you know, Coach Cottle and the other coaches were placing a heavy emphasis on getting the ball up and out quick and getting the ball to the athletes quick so they can run it over the midline and give our offense, you know, as much time as possible to score a goal because, you know, in that league, everyone's so talented. You really need the guys to click for as long as possible in order to earn a goal. Well, you had Connell coaching you, and then you had John Tillman coaching you. Which style have you copied more between the two? Uh, I definitely take things from both. Um, I think Coach Cottle is, you know, very brilliant with his X's and O's as an offensive guy. Um, so I, I definitely take a lot of plays and, you know, being a little bit personable with the players in that regard from Coach Cottle. And I probably uh, I'm a little tougher on players like Coach Cottle in terms of being direct and, you know, maybe dropping some curses, but, curse words. But uh, – <laughs> Some of the things I really admire from Coach Tillman is like his organization, his dedication, and uh, attention to detail. Um, he's one of those guys that holds his players accountable, number one through number fifty or whoever's at the end of the uh, end of the ranks. And you know, he's one of those guys that sees the whole field very well. He's mastered the clear, the riding, all the small things that make you know a team go from good to great. So. Um, I try to do my best with that, but I mean, I honestly think he's one of the best coaches out in the game right now. So, you know, to to learn anything from him is definitely something I'm trying to do. All right, so you got you got locked up into a three year deal with the uh, uh, Chesapeake BayHawks. I know you got to be happy about that. And then the rumor comes out about the new league with Paul Rabel. Did you did, were you aware of that when you signed the contract? Was that a rumor, or where where did that enter into your mindset of signing the deal? Yeah, so I think right around there was like whispers of it going on during the summer. And, you know, I was just trying to really tune that out because, you know, in the summer you're trying to compete and win win a championship. And then I heard about it a little bit before um, it went public. And for me, I just thought I kind of weighed both options. And, you know, I've been with the Bayhawks since 2015, uh, 2014 winter. And, you know, the familiarity I have with the program the familiarity I have with Coach Cottle, you know, I really respect him, and I think our team is pretty close knit. And I think you're going to see a lot of the guys stick together on the Bayhawks and try to make a run at a championship. I personally think the MO is a great organization, and I think that you know, over the next few years, you're going to see it improve. I've already seen some improvements since my time in the league, and um, you know, our owner, B. Brendan Kelly, he, he's not afraid of the competition, and you know, if there's another league that pops up, so be it. But we're going to focus on us and handle our business in the MLL. Well, it's a good thing. The more that look, there's a lot of lacrosse players out there. I mean, I know you're the considered one of the best goalies in the MLL, but there's a lot of goalies out there who couldn't even make a roster that are good goalies. So it's not like the talent's not out there. And uh, it's only good for lacrosse in my eyes. But the smartest thing they did was finally starting the season after Memorial Day. I just thought it was so ridiculous to start the season early because of the competition with college. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that made the league a little interesting in terms of it put a little bit more stress on the general managers and the coaches to, you know, communicate and find some players from the player pool and the supplemental draft and, you know, orchestrate your roster for the early season. And it did make things interesting because it, it always felt like there was a beginning – a middle and end to the season now. Um, every play, it's going to be a lot more competitive, so you might not see some of the supplemental guys or um, some of the older veterans as much, especially if they're trying to inject some younger talent into the league. Um, but I think overall, it is going to give the fans a chance to transition from okay, hey, we're coming off the college season. You're going to see all the Memorial Day stuff. You're going to see all the champions, the tour ends. And then you're going to see these young guys go right into the draft and then get on a professional team. And I think we're going to earn some more fans through that because they're going to be, you know, following their favorite players or favorite team members and see where they go next. And I think that's something that 
has kind of gotten lost in the shuffle in years past. As a coach, Nico, I mean, you certainly was one of the top players in the country, All-American three years, and then now the MVP and the uh, goal, co-MVP as a goalie. How tough is it for you to, like, you know, you're in a D3 level, so your players are not, I would assume they're not at that top, top level of talent. How tough is that for you to adjust to that, you know, not having a Rambo there or not having the tremendous talent you had at Maryland or Lyle Thompson at the, in the MLL? How tough is that? Yeah, it's definitely a learning curve. I mean, I love the players I have. I've been given. I chose them. They didn't really choose me. Um, I do have some freshmen that I did recruit, but, um, you know, you'd be surprised with the talent they have, but at the same time, you know, th- these guys are, are at Immaculata and Division Three guys are at, at D3 locations for a reason. And, you know, I think I'm still honing my coaching skills. So it's a learning curve and a learning process for all of us. And realistically, we're just looking for constant improvement and growth on a day-to-day basis. And it's really cool to be, you know, playing at a high level and being able to pick the brains of, you know, awesome players, awesome coaches, and then use the film, use – some of the other tools I've gotten from Maryland and, and the Bayhawks to kind of pass down to these guys. Um, you know, the majority of my guys didn't really start playing until they were later or they're kind of diamonds in the rough from some lesser known programs. So there's some talent, but we definitely have our work cut out for us. Yeah, there's no doubt. But I know from watching, I live about one minute from Stevenson. And I watch, I might go to three or four Stevenson games during the year. And sometimes I look at the talent out there in it's it's a very fine line of the difference, all right, in ability. And you've seen that in the MLL because you've had some D3 players make it in the MLL. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is Division One. you know, you're really putting in a lot more hours physically and um, in the what I call the lacrosse classroom, so the film room, I don't think you get that as much at the Division Three level um, with the rules and and the coaching, but you know, most of the things that I think separate a Division One All-American versus a Division Two or Three All-American is kind of from the neck up or, you know, it's more cerebral or it's a little bit of, hey, can you do this on the move a little bit better than that guy? Or do you have a, a skill set that sticks out? So it's, it, you're right. It is a fine line. Well, anyway, congratulations to you on signing the three-year deal. It's got to give you some security along with IDA. I know he did and uh, a bunch of other Terps on uh, on the Bayhawks and uh, some non-Terps too. And uh, how do you feel about playing with the Hopkins guys? Is it like is it like still a little thing there or is that just during when they play each other? Um, for me, I think it's definitely more intense when you're playing in college. <laughs> I'm not sure we have any Hopkins guys on our roster right now that I can think of off the top of my head. But, um, you know, at this point in my career, and I think the majority of the people that are still playing, you know, they're chasing championships and and, and always ultimately putting the team first. So, um, you know, we don't do this for millions of dollars yet, but at the end of the day, the pride factor and, you know, what we play for is very important. So for me, at the end of the day, I want to make the best memories possible at this next level and try to compete and bring my best every day to help the team win the championship. Last question. You still talk to Doc a lot? Yeah, I still run into him. Uh, believe it or not, we're we're actually neighbors back home in Philly. So he's about a, a two-minute walk from my house and um, I don't get the chance to see him on an everyday basis like I did when I worked for him at, after college. But, you know, we work a few camps together throughout the year, usually one in the fall, one in the winter, and one in the summer. So um, we definitely get to pick each other's brains and have a little friendly competition, especially as him being a assistant coach for the Wizards, too. Well, it might take a few years, but I'm sure, I'm sure you'll join him in Maryland Hall of Fame one day. And, uh, Nico, thanks a lot for coming on, and uh, we wish you the best, and congratulations on your signing of the contract, and have a great season this year. I'm going to do my best to get out to see Immaculata one game this year for sure. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. All right. Good to talk to you, Nico. All right. With that, as we are just about out of time, uh, if you want to listen to the coaches show, DJ Durkin, uh, Matt Canada will be on 
1057, the fan, after this is over. And, uh, you know, go over here what he has to say. The Terps are 3 and 1 with a huge game against Michigan. And if you're going to ask me what's happening with DJ Durkin, I still don't know. Uh, you hear rumors, you hear this, you hear that. And uh, I guess it's it's the decision that has to be coming up soon. I know the Board of Regents meets on the 19th of October, which is, what, two weeks away. So uh, I assume it will happen by then. We're out of time. Thanks for listening. See you Saturday on Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. Thanks for listening, everyone.